good to see everybody. Let us rise on our feet when we start the service. Today is a blessed day, amen? And the Lord created today so we can remember and celebrate the event that took time 2,000 years ago is the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, he is risen. And as a body of Christ, it's not just one day for us, it's a lifestyle of remembrance what Jesus did for us on the cross when he was buried, laid in the tomb for three days. And the third day, God was faithful to his word. He resurrected him from the dead. And you and I today have all the reasoning to praise him. You and I today have all the reasoning to have joy, peace, thanksgiving for what he has done for us. Amen? Come on, lift up your hands. Thank him this morning for what he has did for you. Jesus, we thank you that today, Lord, we celebrate the resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. This morning, Lord, we are reminded that nothing is impossible for you, God. And your word says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it lives in us, Lord. And today, we have all the reasons to celebrate the life of Jesus to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy. Come on, let something out of your mouth. Jesus, you are worthy. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you thanksgiving, Lord. Hallelujah. Who is our voice this morning? 
resurrection of Jesus Christ. We come with our hearts full of gratitude this morning. We can't thank you enough, God, for sending your son that we may live in freedom this morning, that we don't have to live in struggle or in pain. God, I pray that this morning that we would not become too familiar with your presence, that we would not become too familiar with your presence, but that you would just wash over us, God, with your blood, purify your bride.
To you alone, Jesus Christ. We give you all honor and all praise in this place. The one that was dead, but resurrected. And today, you are alive forever and ever. And you will never die. We give you praise and glory. Our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to Jesus. This wonderful day on Sunday. I would like us не в шаблоне not just a ritual like we usually do it but those that have resurrected from the dead because God's word says the reason of sin and decay we were dead I was dead but thanksgiving to our Lord that his great love and his mercy he sent Jesus Christ that died for my sin and resurrected for my forgiveness Christ is risen hallelujah Praise be to God. Let us greet one another. The one that's next to you. Bless them. I'm happy to greet all of you who came to this place. And those that are watching us online, we also greet you. And we're happy that you're with us on the celebratory service. Сегодня мы празднуем. Today we celebrate. Потому что это наш праздник. Because this is our celebration. Это наш праздник. This is our celebration. Знаете, с воскресением связана наша жизнь. You know, with resurrection, it holds our life. Поэтому мы сегодня говорим о жизни. Today we're speaking about life. Но что я, что я бы хотел подметить? What would I like to underline? Живя в этой стране. Living in this country. Если вы внимательны, вы обратили на это внимание. If you have draw your attention to this point. Что происходит подмена? There is exchange taking place. Знаете, всегда праздник Пасхи. Always Passover celebration. Он обозначался как Пасовар. It is marked as Passover. В этой стране. In this country. Как никогда в последние годы. Like never before in the last years. Говорят Easter. They're saying the word Easter. Easter не связан. Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter это имя божества. Easter is a name of a pagan god. На востоке это был Иштар. On the east, it was, his name was Ishtar. В Азии это была Астарта или же Артемида. In Asia, it was Astarte or Ar- Artemia. Это бог плодородия. It's the god of multiplication. Что связывает Пасху? What is in common with Passover with eggs and bunnies? There is nothing in common. But worship to Esther or Easter it's a has a symbol eggs and bunnies. And today this creeped in into Christianity, sadly to say. And we look at it as just for our kids. This is for the kids. You know, for the kids today, even Halloween is accepted by Christianity. It is just fun for the kids. Вы знаете, нету ничего общего у тьмы со светом. There is nothing in common with light and darkness. 
У Христа и Велиара нету ничего общего. Christ and Vialar, there's nothing in common. И нету ничего общего между Божеством Истер и Иисусом Христом, Господом нашим и Спасителем. And there is nothing common with Easter and our Lord Jesus Christ. Может быть, кому-то я резко говорю Maybe сегодня. Maybe I'm speaking sharp this morning. Может быть, для вас сегодня это в какой-то степени новость. Maybe for you this is the news. Но если вы будете вникать в историю, into the history and the roots these pagan gods are returning and they take gain in the 1960s in this country Bible was executed when it was read at schools in public schools we had prayer and they took it away instead of that other things creeped in Знаете, сегодня этот праздник you know, today the celebration не зашел на то, to a point чтобы просто сказать just to say, Христос воскрес Christ is risen, и, и все связано с удовольствием. And everything has to do with pleasure. Божество Истар the или Истар Easter God, это божество женское. It's a female uh, gender goddess. Я, я больше вам скажу. I'll go further than that. Это божество, которое связано с развратом. This goddess has to do with decay or perversion. Сексуальное развращение. Sexual, sexual perversion. Знаете, в то время, In еще до time, Христа, prior of Christ, поклонение этому божеству, they were worshiping this goddess. В этих храмах, In these temples, мужчины одевали женскую одежду. Men were dressing up as women. Вы знаете, месяц июнь, you know, the month of June was marked as a month of worshiping to this goddess. LGBTQ. <laughs> I can break my tongue saying that. The month of June is marked for that month uh, for that Короче, celebration. Буквах, and all these letters and attributes, all these filth got filth put together. Говорят, время, and some people say this is a time of accepting it all. Нет. No. Не we don't accept all. Жертва Иисуса была принесена за людей. The sacrifice of Jesus was given for people. Взяв и грехи, took sin upon himself. Чтобы они избавились от грехов. For them to leave their sin. И жили для правды. And live for righteousness. Это цель была прихода Иисуса. That is the purpose of coming of Jesus. Поэтому когда мы сегодня говорим, that's what today when we speak, Христос воскрес. Christ is risen. Мы говорим о победе Его. We declare His victory. Над всем всякими божествами. Over all goddesses. Над Богом Ваала. Over the God of Baal. Также Истер. And also Esther. И также Малох. And also Manoch. Эти божества они сокрушены. These Lord figures are broken. Силу воскресения нашего Господа. With the power resurrection of our Lord. Иисуса Христа. Jesus Christ. Павел говорит, Paul says, чтобы мы for us, не, не преклонялись под чужое ярмо didn't bow of others yoke, с людьми, которые неверны, people that are not faithful, но чтобы мы but for us, были соединены со Христом, to be united with Christ, и соединяющиеся с Господом. And those who unite with the Lord, есть один Дух с Господом. They are the one spirit with the Lord. Знаете, это отдельная тема. This is a different subject. Когда-нibuть я поделюсь с вами there come a moment I'm going to share this with you of the things that we live among that became so accessible to the church which doesn't have place his church that is washed with the blood of the Lamb has no filth or markings it will receive Jesus and purity and righteousness the meeting will happen in the cloud this is the church the one he died for this is you and I washed by the blood of Jesus Да, в этой церкви разные люди, yeah, church, которые были мертвы по преступлениям и грехам. Разные люди. Да. 
Yes. И проститутки. And prostitutes. И гомосексуалисты. And homosexuals. И наркоманы. And drug addicts. И люди, которые в криминале. And people that are in the criminal range. Кто бы они ни были. Regardless of who they are. По преступлениям и грехам. Because of their transactions. Они были мертвые. They were dead. Но благодарение Богу. But thanksgiving to God. Что по его великой любви. That because of his great love. И милости. And mercy. God has saved each and every one of us including all the categories of those sins that people were in. And today he continues to save homosexuals, lesbians. He breaks the spirit and takes away these people that today those people can celebrate the resurrection of a new life in Christ Jesus. Brothers asked me to share about offering. Я вижу, вы больше этому обрадовались, нежели тому, что я до этого говорил. You got more excited about offering than uh, my prior word. Это серьезная тема, которую я затронул. Я не думал ее говорить. Serious subject that I have touched. I wasn't planning on speaking on it. Но я сегодня удивлен. But today I'm surprised. Тому, что происходит в христианском мире в Америке и не только. Of what's happening in the world of Christianity and in America. Но кто-то должен об этом начать говорить. But somebody has to start speaking about it. Кто-то должен. Someone must. Потому что дети. Because children. Которые сегодня, когда говорят ради детей. That people tell me it's for our kids. Они пропитываются этим. They are soaked in that. Говорят, когда они вырастут, они поймут. They say when they grow up, they'll understand. К сожалению. Sadly to say. Они принимают другую сторону. They accept the other side. И они воспринимают другие вещи. And they accept other things. Знаете. You know. Мы должны быть терпимы к людям. We have to be patient towards people. Но не терпимы к греху. Not patient towards sin. Сегодня люди. Today people. Они не терпимы к людям. They're not patient towards people. Но терпимы к греху. But they're patient towards sin. Мы должны это поменять. We have to change that around. Мы должны любить людей. We have to love people. И ненавидеть грех. And hate the sin. Чтобы нести Божье слово. To take God's word. В этот мир. To this world. Мы должны любить этот мир. We have to love this world. Но ненавидеть грех. But hate the sin. Чтобы вытаскивать их оттуда. To take these people away from there. Знаете, Павел был образованный человек. Он закончил высшую школу того времени. Он учился у ног Гамалиила. И он получил это образование. Но прошло время. Когда христианство начало прогрессировать, он начал гнать христиан. Когда он ехал в Дамаск, свет ослепил его с неба. Это был Иисус. Он имел встречу с ним. И после этой встречи, это образованный человек, man, он говорит, я все he says, All, до этого момента, point, к чему стремятся люди, к признанию, к признанию, к славе, to glory, к власти, to authority, он все это имел. И он говорит, все это said, things, я почитаю за сор. I consider as nothing for me to engage in the understanding of Jesus, Jesus Christ, in order for me to acknowledge him and the power of his resurrection. This person, if you look at his life, people are trying to get there. Он берет и отвергает. He takes that and moves it aside. При встрече с Иисусом. Just for the sake of seeing Jesus. Что-то изменилось в нем. Something changed in him. Ценности поменялись. His values have changed. То, что он чем дорожил. Everything that he was cherishing. Вдруг это погасло в его жизни. All of a sudden become nothing in his life. И все, что он думал, что это зло. And everything that he thought was evil. И гнал это. And he persecuted it. Но имея реальную встречу с Иисусом. By having a real relationship with Jesus. Он увидел, что он в жизни. 
that in life, having obtained all, he missed the most important thing. It's the encounter with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of our life. He is the fullness. And today, everything that's going around our life, we have to encounter this identity. When we speak about offerings, today, this is a special offering we'll be doing. We connect this with the resurrection because the seed when it's sowed into the soil it will only receive harvest when it dies. When we sacrifice we bring this into the altar. That's what it's called sacrificial giving. This year when when the media is proclaiming things getting worse and we see that things are getting world on the world arena the war is spoken about greater than success and people that are ruling economics they're in a dead end politicians are in a dead end but amongst all those things there is a people on this earth that don't go based on information that comes from this world. They live because of what the Lord has told them. Isaac Isaac, in a time of famine, when there was drought, when nobody was sowing, he took the seed and sowed it. He said, what are you doing? You took the last seed that you're sowing. It will just go in vain because it's drought. Hold this for the better times. When the rains come, then you'll have the timing to sow. But right now you're just throwing it out. No. He believed in God. And he sowed during the drought. And he was able to reap the harvest that went above all a hundred times he reaped the harvest. Why? the circumstances around him said don't do this but God said I will be with you and everything you will do I will bless it you know when we started the remodel we were just moving forward on it and that time the economy was great things were moving well but in one moment we were praying about this project I always ask the Lord Lord why are you holding time God is never late and I received the word that day you're going to build during a crisis Lord, how? During the crisis, when people are limiting themselves, he says then, during the crisis, I want to be glorified. I remember Pastor Tommy Barnett, Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. We were having fellowship. And they have a big dream center in Los Angeles. It's a previous hospital that they bought. He said, we needed the resources to restore this building. And I asked, Tommy Lord, I just need these resources. If I had on my account 20, 30 million dollars, easily we would have fixed up this building. And the Lord responded to him, if you had these resources, you wouldn't have a need in me. During the crisis, 
Мы зависим от Господа. Не от экономики. Не от того, какой президент придет. От Господа мы зависим. А Он говорит, вы испытайте меня. И я открою небеса. И не имеет значения, какие потрясения и какой кризис. И я изолью то избытка. И вы не будете иметь нужды. Вы знаете, когда мы имеем дело с Богом, you know, Lord, Он всегда проверит наше сердце. Сегодня я хочу вас поощрить в этот год, year, когда так тяжело, so difficult, может быть, у кого-то сократи, сократился бизнес. Business Доверься Господу для прорыва и посей. В это время, time, когда Бог стоит за эту церковь, church, вы увидите, see, если у кого-то будет закрываться бизнес, closing, вы будете процветать. Prosper, если вы доверитесь, если вы доверите этот вопрос Господу. В моей жизни это было так много In раз. Life, so Казалось, в этот момент мне самому так это нужно. И Внутренне я понимал, я должен это отдать Господу. Вот это место, где мы собираемся, это не только для служения, это для различных мероприятий. Мы сейчас приступили к тому, чтобы сделать нам банкетный зал. Сделать кухню, to do a commercial kitchen, сделать спортивное, спортивный зал для to, молодых людей. И не только, а для всех, кто пожелает. All, basketball, basketball, volleyball. Это, конечно, нужны средства на это. Of course, we need the funds for these things. И сегодня часть работы сделана. And today we already did Partially the work. И мы, конечно, молимся о том, чтобы нам закончить эту фазу, phase, не имея долгов. Как хочется, чтобы кто-то пришел really и покрыл все эти расходы. Но Господь сказал, из вашей среды, из этой церкви, church, я буду побуждать людей, которые будут финансировать это мои источники, которых я буду обогащать. И люди, которые незначительные, сделают значительные вещи. И я верю в это. Знаете, камень, you know, rock, он был при, привален к гробу. Когда Иисус лежал в гробе, tomb, была сплошная тьма. И не было никакой надежды. Все ученики разбежались. Этот, на этот камень наложили печати. Чтобы это знак, что его никто не сдвинет. И поставлены были воины, которые сторожили, чтобы никто не коснулся. Но что-то произошло, что потрясло это место. Оказывается, Слово Божье говорит, word of word, the word of God что says, смерть и ад that death and hell не могли удержать его, could not retain him, не имели силы not удержать его. Он воскрес на третий день. He resurrected on the third day. Камень был отвален. The rock was moved. Иисус восстал из мертвых. Rose from the dead. Если в твоей жизни уже что-то сильно привалено и ограничивает твою жизнь, а возможно ты находишься в ситуации, где нет надежды, без надежды, все закрыто. Я хочу тебе сказать, сегодня, today, когда мы говорим о воскресении Иисуса, мы говорим Jesus, о силе воскресения, которая способна коснуться именно того места, to area, где, кажется, уже нет жизни, и no все закончилось. Бог силен на том месте, place, где смерть царствует. 
явить славу свою своего воскресения и поднять это. Не сомневайся в этом. Бог силен это сделать. Поэтому ваши финансы, которые сегодня мы принесем, пусть это будет больше, чем обычно. Проверь Господа. И я не хочу, чтобы это было в эмоциях. Но чтобы это был Дар веры. But let us be a giving of faith. Trusting God. Когда ты отдаешь это, when you give this, уповая на Него, depending on Him, принимая этот год, receiving this со всеми year, трудностями, with all the hardships, но веря, but believing, что Он проведет тебя, that will He lead you. Он проведет тебя через трудности. He will lead you through your troubles. И ты не просто будешь иметь достаток. Not only you will have abundance, Его слово говорит, but His word says, изобилие придет you will have more во всех сферах to all the fears of your life. Во имя Иисуса. In the name of Jesus Christ. Давайте мы поднимемся. Let us rise. Драгоценный Господь. Dear Lord. Прямо сейчас. Right now. Я верю всем сердцем. I believe with all my heart. В твое слово. In your word. Оно есть истина. It is the truth. Сейчас мы становимся right now we stand на это обетование, on those promises которое имеет силу. That have the power. Сейчас среди всего, что происходит вокруг нас, Today, everything that goes around us, мы опираемся на Твое Слово, we're depending on your word, которое говорит, that says, Ты не оставишь нас you will not leave us, и не покинешь. And you will not forsake Ты us. будешь с нами you will be with us. во все дни for all of our days till the end times you will lead us through the hardships and the shakiness and you will bring us to an open place if we have faith in you. I bless Church of Truth especially I ask for every husband and wife that every family они были преданы Тебе, имели Твой страх и следовали за Тобой. Я благословляю, благословляю их работы, их бизнеса, то, что они начали, чтобы оно развивалось, чтобы сегодня Ты через их даяние мог прикоснуться к их нуждам и восполнил их. Во имя Иисуса Jesus, мы просим Тебя you, и воздаем Тебе славу. И все, кто верит в это, скажите Аминь. Аллилуйя. My young people, that's what I'm talking about right now. That's what I'm talking about. The youth know. If you could stand to your feet with me. I felt that support, G4T. I felt it. I love you. Please turn to a few neighbors and tell them why you're thankful to see them here today. We are thankful to see everybody here, those that are with us online. We welcome all of you. We greet all of you. As Pastor said, today is a very special day for us who came to know Christ and were saved by him and follow him. Today, the church all over the world celebrates the day of his resurrection when he was buried for three days as we read in the book of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. But on the third day, even though that tomb was sealed with a, with a big stone and guards stood in front of it, and there was a plan to keep him inside there that no one could have imagined, Paul writes in Corinthians, that having crucified him, what God would do through the power of his Holy Spirit to bring Jesus, who was visibly, uh, I should say not visibly, but seen by all on that moment he hung on the cross where his body was torn and Isaiah says that you couldn't even tell that he was a man. In that horrific state that Jesus was in, 
that it was hard to even to look upon him. And if you looked upon him, you could not tell that he was a man. That body then was cleaned up, wrapped in linen cloth, and put in a tomb from, by, was it Joseph of Arimathea? He came to Pilate and said, I'll take his body. Can I take his body and put him in my tomb? He puts him in that tomb. And that body, that same body that was torn by the soldiers, that was torn because of the sin that he took upon himself for our sake, was then raised to life on the third day. And that stone was rolled away, and the soldiers fell as if they were dead. The women are walking to the tomb thinking, how are we going to roll that stone away to, to anoint his body? And when they came, the stones rolled away. Who got here before us? And they come, and the angel's there, and he began to announce to them this good news. Who are you looking for among the dead? For he is risen. He is no longer dead, but he is alive. And go. Go to the brethren, go to the disciples and tell them that Christ has risen. And of course, they didn't believe her or them. And Peter and John run, run there to see for themselves he's not there. They begin to wonder what happened. And today we remember, today we remember Christ's resurrection. And I want us to pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for every person that is here. We thank you for your presence in this place, Holy Spirit. We ask that you would speak to us. No matter how many years we have been here or how many times we've celebrated this day, God, that today you would speak to each person. That those that are here, God, that maybe are dealing with things and going through things, that this would not just be something they hear about, but today that there was, it would be something they experience. We bless, Lord. We bless your church. We bless every person that is here. And we thank you for what you've prepared for us. We thank you, our wonderful Father in heaven. We thank you that you raised your son from the dead, death, that dead, death could not hold him down, that no angel, no demon, no nothing could hold him there in that grave, but you raised him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you so much for this miracle. We thank you so much for what took place on that day for what we have experienced today because of that and what we continue to experience. We thank you so much. We bless one another in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Before we get into the message together, um, if there's anybody here that's visiting our church this Sunday, whether you got invited by somebody or you found us online or you just looked around for a church to go to on this Sunday, could you raise your hand just let us know that you're here and the church is going to say hi to you, hello. If you could keep your hand up, we greet all of you. We're glad that you're with us. And yeah, more hands over there. We're glad that you're with us. We believe that you're here for a reason and God's prepared something for you. Um, you know, if there's anyone that is here and you're not a part of a local church, you know, today it does happen to be one of those days, as Pastor talked about, that there are more people in church all over the world than arguably more than any other day of the year, maybe Christmas. But there are a lot of people that go to church on this day uh, because they have some kind of understanding um, or enough knowledge that, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's when Jesus was raised from the dead. And historians prove that that was so, and my dad or my mom told me about that, so I grew up going to church on that day, and so I'm, that's why I'm at church. And if that happens to be you, or if you're, or if you're just watching us online uh, today, if back in the day you had to go to church uh, on this day, then today people have the privilege of opening up their phone and just looking at, looking at a church online, and this is the only day of the year that they watch a church online. So if you're watching us online, um, I want to encourage you. The Word of God, the Word of God does not give you the option of going to church if you follow Christ. The Word of God says that there's been a place prepared for you in the body of Christ because the church is not just this building, though obviously this is a church. The church is people that Christ has saved, that he has brought together, and he has formed a body. And the Word of God says that in that body, every person has been given a place. Hebrews 10.25 says that we're not supposed to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as we see his coming back returning. 
And so if you're here, um, you know, I'm not, even, I'm not even trying to convince you. I, I want to say that if you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, then it is, it is a byproduct. It's natural for us to want to be around other believers, to be a part of a local church, to be, under, to be under the teaching of a church, to be involved, to carry each other's burdens, to help, to serve. That is a byproduct of following Christ. If we ever have to force people to serve God, to go to church, then it's, we have to first ask the question, have they met Christ? Have they experienced Christ's love? Have they experienced the salvation that the Bible talks about? Because, you know, um, for example, I, I leave to work uh, for the most part every, uh, every day during the week. Sometimes I'll have an office day. I don't leave to work. But for the most part, I get up early um, and then I leave to work. When my work day ends, I don't have to convince myself there at work at my job site, okay, I need to go home now. I need to go to my wife. I need to go to my children. If you need to convince yourself to go home, we can talk after the service. But you're, it's, a, it's a natural thing. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to coming home. I'm looking forward to seeing my wife, to seeing my children. I, I often drive home and I think about what child's going to come run into me first and, and expecting that moment. I'm excited to come home. I'm excited to see my wife. You know, that's natural to me because I've been joined to my wife, the children that I have God's given to me. It's crazy that we're living in a time, and I want to just go off of what Pastor was talking about. We're living in a time when church is just this social thing that I have to attend where I, I fear God enough, I know God enough that I need to go to church to hear the word, to do some worship, and then I jump right back into my life. And we separate these things. But the church, the church was never meant to be something that you did once a week. It's something that you become because of Christ who reveals himself to you. And in Ephesians 1, Paul gives this revelation to the church in Ephesus. He begins to write to them. He says in chapter 1, did you know that long before the foundations of the world, that God chose each one of you in Christ? He adopted you into his family long, long ago. And then he ends this chapter by saying, this family I'm talking about, and I'm just saying this in my words, the family I'm talking about is the body of Christ of which Jesus is the head. This is the church that you have been made a part of. See, my relationship towards the church is this is not just a, a Christian community that I'm a part of, that I come to hear the word, I, I come to worship, I give tithe here because the church needs my money, I'm involved here because that's what good Christians do. No, this church has become my family because in the family of God, we have been adopted through Christ. He has become our father. You have become a brother to me, a sister to me. It's not just a place I gather on Sundays. It's a place where I am a part of a family. Are you with me? You're awfully quiet. If you don't have the revelation that the church is your family, you're missing what God has done through Christ for you. Because I look forward to being here just like I look forward to going home. I look forward, being, I look forward to seeing people here just like I look forward to seeing my kids. Why? Because this is the family that God's made me a part of. Can I say a little bit more? Today I like this church. Next week, I like another. The following month, I like another church. And I'm like a free bird going to whatever church I want because I, I'm a Christian. I'm a part of the universal church. Do you know that most of the New Testament you can't accomplish unless you're a part of a local church? You can't fulfill most of the New Testament scripture regarding how you're supposed to live if you're not grafted into a local church. You can't carry people's burdens. You can't serve your neighbor. You can't help, you can't help those that you have been a part, made part of the same body. You can't discover what your gift is because to discover what your gift is means you have to serve the body because the gift God's given in you, yes, every person here, turn to your neighbor right now, hit your neighbor on the shoulder and say, you have a gift God's given you. This is not in my notes. This is free. This is not in my notes. God's given you a gift, but do you know how you discover that gift? We've been talking about this with our internship. You discover that gift by serving those that are sitting next to you. That's how the gift is discovered. Because the gift is not for you. The gift is to, for the person that's sitting next to you. And when you begin to serve the person next to you, you begin to discover what gift God's given you to be able to help that person. Unbelievable how God has connected us to serve one another and that through each other, our needs are fulfilled. 
Prayers are answered. Encouragement's given. Burdens are carried. We intercede for one another. We help one another. We stand by one another. That's what God's done through Christ in his church. But um, like in any marriage, in any family, and especially if you have children, there can be tension. There can be things that come up in the home where you're like, man, I'm, I'm dealing with this with this child. I'm dealing with this with this kid. I got something going on between me and my wife, and you're going through things. You know, it would be so foolish for me if I had some kind of conflict to decide, you know what, tonight I'm not coming home. I'm going to sleep somewhere else. I'm going to go to another, I'm going to go to one of my friend's houses and just, you know, find a couch. Now, I'm going to begin to destroy my family if I do that. But for some reason, we can go to whatever church we want to and not take responsibility for the church that God has made us a part of. You know, somebody maybe didn't like what Pastor was sharing. And that you have a right to not like it and then to choose what you believe. But we're living in a really crucial time when we can easily get offended. We can easily make our own decisions and feel like we're entitled to whatever we want to do. But I want to tell you, you're not completely free if you're doing what you want to do. You become free when you ask, when you do what God asks you to do. True freedom in the kingdom of God is not a person's independence. It's a person's dependence on the God that he's decided to follow. True freedom in the kingdom of God is not what's better for me. It's understanding what God has for me and walking down that road. Jesus didn't say, listen, this is going to be such a wonderful, easy journey. Pick up your cross and follow me. No, he said, I want you to deny yourself. And if you desire to follow me, then you can pick up your cross and begin to follow me. The invitation to follow Christ is first, desire, and second, denial. That's not easy. That's not easy to do. But I want to testify, and if anybody else at Church of Truth today can testify that being a part of this local church, being a part of this family, being under the leadership that we have, and Pastor Sergey is our pastor, and this building God has given us, I am so blessed by God to be in this church where I have grown, where I got saved, filled the Holy Spirit, found my wife, hallelujah, come on somebody, found my wife, dedicated each of my children. I am so thankful to God to be a part of this local church and everything you know you ain't in it if you don't go through every season you know when somebody when somebody sees uh, our youth conference which is coming up this month what is it it's april tomorrow's april 1st got you all right um april g4t conference april 25th to the 27th right youth we're so how excited are we about this event <laughs> Y'all need to restart my time because I'm still just greeting the church right now. Um, but, you know, when people come here for the youth conference and they see all the young people and they see, you know, they see this place full of young people and the worship and the praise and everything. I remember uh, just recently I had a conversation with Pastor Slavic and he, um, remember youth, that service we had when Pastor Robert was here, Pastor Robert Mosbuck, and he he preached and then he started, he prayed. He prayed at that service for every young person that was here. We ended our prayer at 3.30 in the morning. Um, long, long service. He prayed for every person that was present at that service. And I, at the beginning of that service, Pastor Slavic walked in. And he shared this with me after the service. He said, I remembered, for some reason, I remember this moment when I walked into, this, into the building when we were still in our old sanctuary and, and, and there wasn't a lot of people and when you walked into the, into the sanctuary, you could like, you could taste the dryness, you know. Like it's worship, but it's just like, it's just not going. It's a, it's a hard atmosphere. It was dry, not a lot of people. He's like, I show up to that service, and, and we're praying, and we're worshiping. And God just began to show, God began to give a dream to his heart, a vision to him. That a time will come when that sanctuary won't fit the, young, the amount of young people that we're going to have in this church. But it was just a handful of people in there, and it's like, it, just, it was one of those just tough services. And, he, and God began to speak to him. You just keep, you keep praying. You keep serving. You keep gathering at your home. You keep 
keep investing into the young people, one day they won't fit here. And when he walked in, when he walked into the service where Pastor Mark, Robert was here, and we were, there were, remember how many people here? There was a lot of people at that service, a lot of people. And, pa- and Pastor Salik was like, and I remember that moment. Because when he walked in the sanctuary, the presence of God was so strong. All these young people worshiping, praying. It was just so easy to be here. If you stayed till like late, people were just here, just walking around praying because it was such an easy atmosphere to be in. But you know, when you're already experiencing the promise, it's different when you're walking still through the process. It's so much better um, when you go through the process of preparing your meal. Did anybody like to cook here? This is, this is the Holy Spirit, because I'm, I didn't plan on talking about food, but it's a special Sunday. You know, when you, I love to come over to someone's house and they cook a meal or we go out somewhere with my wife, but when you're at home and you prepare, like, and especially if you're really hungry and you're like preparing this food, you can smell it, the garlic, the onions, come on somebody, the cilantro, the lime, this is, this is, what makes up most of our house and, you know, our other kids. Um, and you smell all this and you're like, wow, like, and you're preparing the food and then you sit down with your family and you begin to eat what you prepared. It's just different when you went through the process of buying it and preparing it and getting it ready. It's different when you're a part of a church and you go through hard seasons and you pray like pastor did at the beginning of the year, God is going to enrich our church and bless our church and build our church in the time of trial, in the time of the economy dropping, and you get a promise from God, and then you begin to go through that trial. You begin to go through that difficult season as a church, and God begins to provide for you, and God begins to give the promise that he gave to you in that desert. He begins to speak to you and fulfill what he he told you yesterday. When you begin to go through those seasons and those promises, it just begins to taste different. It begins to taste different, and you understand that I'm not just here because this is a good season. I am here until the Lord takes me. I'm here until he comes back. I'm here because this is where he grafted me in to be. And you just begin to, it begins to be different. And when everybody begins to run because it's not comfortable, you stand your ground because you know your place. You've been in it when it was dry. You've been in it when you had no money. You were in it when you were driving on the last tank of gas. You were in it when your friends were turning away. You were in it when you didn't know what to do with your life. You were in it. And when you stay in it and God begins to pour his blessing on you, you don't run to the next blessing because you understand that the place I was standing in before God blessed me is right where I needed to be when he began to speak to me and touch me and now that God has blessed me I'm not looking for the next blessing I'm standing right where I am I'm standing right where I am oh young people love to experience our conference but I wonder if they would go for, through another decade of just being with 10, 15 people in their house and praying and gathering and praying and gathering and praying and gathering and going through the process of what it means to give your life as a sacrifice because then it's just different it's different it tastes different church becomes everything becomes alive when you understand God's leading you and you're walking with God and God has you right where he needs you and you trust God somebody offends you and you go through it somebody hurts you and you go through it you don't give up you don't throw the white towel in you have moments where you just fall on your knees God why am I here what am I going through but you don't give up and Jesus continues listen if I never give up to continue following Jesus he will never ever ever leave me nor forsake me he will always be with me in every Every moment, even when I turn away, he is still there waiting. He leads me through every season. You know, I want to be, I don't know about you, but I want to be a tree that the word of God says is planted by a living stream, giving covering to other people, giving fruit to those that surround it. I want to be that kind of tree. But to be that kind of tree, you need to withstand every season. You need to face every storm with the people that are around you. You need to go through some trials and suffering. And that's when, in those different seasons, your roots begin to grow deeper and deeper in Christ. You find sources and streams in those desert places that you didn't know were there. And God begins to build you and develop you and strengthen you. And everybody said, Amen. All right, thank you for restarting my time. All right, now to the word of God. Okay, today we rejoice in the glorious event of Jesus' resurrection. And I want us to turn <clears throat> to Matthew 16, 18.
Actually, let's go first here. First Peter 1. First Peter 1. I'm sorry. First Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Let me read this again. This is a, a lot of... A lot of A lot here in just a a few verses. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. We are living in the time where we have the Old and New Testament before us. But when we read the New Testament, they were living in a time without this New Testament. Some of these letters were beginning to be written, but they were living in a time where they only had the Old Testament. The major and minor prophets, they had the Torah, which is the five books of Moses. They had Psalms and songs, all these things. They had all these books in the Old Testament. They had them. And from those books, the Word of God says that the prophets of old, through the Spirit of Christ that was in them, We're speaking towards a time that would come of this salvation that God would give and the glory that would follow that salvation. Now, we know Jesus would use these texts to speak about these things. Paul would go to many places and use these texts to speak about proving to the Jewish people that, look, 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 this this is what it says, not in what I have written. This is what it says in what was written of old. This is what was written by Moses. This was written by so-and-so, by David. Look what it said. And all of those things, they pointed towards the future, which was Christ coming to give this salvation and then the glory that would follow that salvation. Now, um, today, of course, we celebrate this, this glory that followed the salvation, this resurrection that took place once Jesus paid the price on the cross. But, If we talk about resurrection, then we must also speak about his death. Because the resurrection would not have been possible unless first he paid the price and went to die. Obviously, you can't raise someone that's not dead. Because he was dead, he was raised to life. And these these two events... You cannot separate them. Paul actually goes as far as to say in Philippians chapter 2 that he counts all things as lost compared to the infinite knowledge of knowing Christ, watch this, and knowing his death and knowing his resurrection. To know and understand his resurrection, we must know and understand his death. And more so, to receive the power of the resurrection we must go through death first. An individual that is not, a, an individual that is not dead cannot be raised to life. Now we have accounts, of course, of Lazarus and uh, the widow whose son was dead, and they were walking out of the city gate, and some others. There is power in his resurrection. Everybody said, "Amen." And there is power. In his death. Oh, come on. There should be a louder amen. There is power in his resurrection. And there is power in his death. There is power in his death. Ephesians 2.1 says regarding you and me. Ephesians 2.1. And you. Yep, you, not me. You. He made alive. What? Who were dead in trespasses and sins. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. I I know as a church we believe in the power 
of Jesus' resurrection. We believe in the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We believe. But we don't want to just know of, the, of this resurrection power, know of the power of his resurrection. We want to experience the power of his resurrection. I don't want today just to be a day we remember his resurrection, but a day that we experience his resurrection, a day where we understand this living power in me that he has given, right? Because what's the point of just remembering his resurrection? What's the point of being here just this one time a year or a couple times a year to hear about how Jesus was raised from the dead, but Jesus was raised from the dead that you would be able to live a new life. This power was given to you. The Bible says that the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in me. The same spirit that rose him from the dead, it lives in me. I don't want to just know of this resurrection. I want the resurrection power through the Holy Spirit to be something that lives in me, to be something that I see working in my life. That it's not just the day I celebrate, but it's every day that I walk in this. Are you here with me? That's what I want. But to have that, you can't just believe in the power of his resurrection. You have to believe in the power of his death. Because on which is dead, the resurrection power comes to bring it to life. Now, before we had resurrection take place, three days before that, he died on the cross. He gave a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He made a payment for every penalty that we have. There was a transaction that took place, an exchange in that moment when he shed his blood for every transgression that I've ever committed. The gospel message is the message God gave to the church to give to the world. And there is no message like it, nor will, be there, nor will there be a message like it. Because in this message, it's not just encouragement, it's not just good news. In this message is the receiving of salvation, the power of God to change an individual's life. And this is the message God gave, this good news to say to every person in this world that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that what he did for you and accomplished for you on the cross, if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, believe in your heart that he did this for you, the Bible says that you are saved. And in this salvation, you experience also the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew 16, 18, that's where I wanted you to go next. Matthew 16, 18, let's read this text. In the verses prior, Jesus is going to ask his disciples, who do men say that I am? They're going to give, to give their answers, then Peter is going to respond that Jesus is Christ. He's the son of the living God. And this is what Jesus is going to say to Peter. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. On this rock I will build my church, Jesus says, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus took responsibility upon himself to build his church. And he gave them a promise that when he builds his church, as he builds his church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means no matter what in this world, visible or invisible, physical or spiritual, no matter what comes against the church, the church that Jesus builds will prevail against everything. Now, my question in this text is how does he build his church? In today's message, just with the time that I have left, we'll make it happen. Today's message is that I am, I want you to say I am, the temple of God. I am the temple of God. I am the temple of God. I will build my church, Jesus said. How does he build his church? If you could go with me to John chapter 2, verse 13. We were just celebrating, and still, still are, Passover 
And look what is happening in this text, Passover as well, verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen, sheep, doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Just imagine this sight. Jesus makes a whip and begins to drive them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he pours out the changers of money and overturns the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. I should know, I need to read that differently. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in just three days? Verse 21, really important. But he was speaking of the temple of his body, not the temple he was in. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, really important, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now the disciples, we know later, when Jesus is raised to the, back to life, they're going to see him. And we also know that when they see him, they lack to believe. Jesus says, why are you afraid? Do you still not believe? Look at me. Thomas wouldn't believe. He shows himself to Thomas. Others didn't believe. He shows himself to them. Two men are walking on the road to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey. They're discouraged. He appears next to them, begins to walk with them, sits at the table with them, breaks the bread, and, he, and they see him for who he is. He begins to reveal himself to many people. But it's important to note that in this text, in verse 22, that when he had arisen from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. His disciples remembered that he said he would destroy this temple and raise it again in three days. These words, maybe some of them did not understand in this moment, but later these words would remind them of what he said and now what he accomplished. And watch, these words that he said, why is he being asked these words? The Jews in the synagogue there are asking him, Show us a sign that gives you the right to do what you're doing. Now, what is he doing? He came in there like the boss. He came in there like he owned the place. He came in there, they didn't know this, like the son of God in his father's home and began to clean up shop. He, get, he made a whip. And then he began to whip around these people and say, listen, this is not supposed to be a place where you sell animals and you make money and you do your business. This is my father's house. You have made it a, a house of merchandise. And he began to whip it and bring it in order. He flips over the money changers. He sends the animals out of the, out, out of the temple. And the Jews stop him or try to stop him in this moment. And they say, what gives you the right to do what you're doing? Show us a sign that gives you the right to do this. He says, the only sign you're going to get is the son of man, the, is that I'm going to destroy this temple, excuse me, I'm going to destroy this temple and raise it in three days. Now, what is Jesus saying here? Jesus, we understand because we keep reading. He's not talking about the building that took them, to, that the building that took them 46 years to build. He's talking about his body. He says... In other words, I have a right to do what I'm doing because it's going to be this body that goes and is destroyed for three days and is going to be raised up again. When the Jews question him to, to demand a sign that would prove that he has authority to clean up the temple, 
He says the only sign you're going to get is this temple is going to be destroyed and raised in three days. Because Jesus would die and be raised in three days gives him the right to clean up the temple. It gives him the right to bring order in the temple. Are you with me? He did not come in there with, with, with a, you know, an authority problem and made this whip like we do at Journey to the Cross and, or Night of Bethlehem and just begin a whip around in this scene and make this whole dramatic episode in the temple. No one's ever done this before. He starts whipping these people around the Jews. Pharisees are standing there. Jews are standing there. They're used to this. This is how the temple's supposed to be. People are making money. People are brought their best animals to sell for someone that needs to bring a sacrifice. It's Passover. This is Passover, by the way, this is business week. This is the week to make some money. And Jesus walks in on their business during Passover. Remember that every Passover, the Bible says, in Leviticus and then in Hebrews, that every Passover lamb was pointing to the lamb that would come one day. And here he is. When they're coming to pick out their lamb, bring their lamb, sell their lamb, make some money, here walks in, they don't know, here walks in the lamb of God on Passover week. And he looks at what's happening during Passover in his father's house. And he begins, he's not raging he doesn't have an anger problem there is there is a zeal the bible says they're quoting a scripture from the old testament there's zeal for god's house there's a desire to see god's house be in order and he grabs this whip and with a righteous anger begins to whip these businessmen out of the temple man we do whatever we can to bring them into the church Jesus was doing whatever he could to get them out of the church. Don't use that for a sermon. Please don't pull that out of my sermon on Instagram. He was whipping them out. Why was he whipping them out? Because they weren't there for Passover. They were there for their merchandise. And when he began to do this, this is, this is something crazy to see. As he's whipping people out during Passover from the temple he's flipping tables he's throwing their money on the ground what have you done to my father's house and the Jews say show us a sign that gives you the right to do what you're doing he says I'll give you a sign this temple will be destroyed and raised again in three days you see only the one who has the zeal for God's house. Why? Because he's the one that's about to carry the sins of Passover. He's the one that is the Passover lamb. He is the only one that has the right to bring God's house, to bring his temple in order. And in this temple, in this temple, that they would come to bring sacrifices for Passover, he is bringing it in order because he's the one that's going to be buried for three days and raised back to life. How about we say it like this? He's the one that is the temple. The temple will be destroyed and raised up in three days. But he's not talking about the building. He's talking about the temple of his body. Now, why is this important? Because in the temple of his body, he is going to take your place and my place and bear our sins upon himself. He is going to kneel at Gethsemane and begin to pray to the Father. Remember Sam out there? Sam, where, where is Sam? Is Sam here? Is he, is he, is he at home? Y'all see, did you guys see Sam's face after that weekend? Who was it? Where is he, Dave? Dave, Dave was slapping Sam around. If you saw the fire in Dave's eyes, this was probably similar to Jesus bringing that whip out in the temple. But Dave, Dave, we're, we need to help Dave. I saw, I saw, I saw Dave really in, in action in that, in that moment. He wanted to hit Sam for whatever reason. He, he has been waiting to hit Sam. You had twins before me? You know, you know, and laid it to him.
Later, when Jesus would rise from the dead, the disciples remembered this moment. And watch this. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. That moment that Jesus spoke those words, later when he rose from the dead, they remembered those words, and those words strengthened their faith. They believed in him and what he accomplished. You see, God desires more than you do, that his Holy Spirit, the power of his Holy Spirit, would dwell in you, would work through you in every area of your life, in your marriage, in your business, in your ch children, in your family, everywhere, that his power through the Holy Spirit would work in you. But the only way for his power to be in me and to work through me, to work in me, to lead me, is the temple must first be brought in order. Jesus understood. He understood that the Father did not want another lamb. He did not want another Passover lamb. He was the lamb that was going to be slain. He was the one that was going to represent you and me in a body like a man. And in this body like a man, he agrees to the will of God to offer himself as a sacrifice. See, before we get to the resurrection, we have this moment of Calvary, of, re of, of, of crucifixion, this hard, dark, scary moment when the disciples flee and scatter, when Jesus is by himself, he is tried four times, he is whipped by Romans, his body is doesn't look like much of a body. He pick up the, picks up the cross to begin to carry it. He is so weak from what's been going on with him and what they've done to him that he drops this cross. They point a man out from the crowd, Simeon, from Serene, an African man. They bring him in. They say, carry this cross for him. And Jesus, staggering with this cross being carried before him by another man, he makes his way to Calvary. And he says these words when he hangs there. It is finished. You see, what Jesus' purpose was, he announces in that moment that he finished his purpose. He fulfilled the will of God over his life. He was the lamb that John said is going to be slain for the world. And he as a lamb on Passover, he as a lamb, he is now on this cross and his body is destroyed and he's torn, beaten for you and for me. And see, what's happening in that moment as he's hanging on that cross is the temple is being destroyed. Or I should say, the temple is being rebuilt. But the only way to rebuild the temple is first to destroy the temple. The only way for an individual to be filled with the holy presence of God is to first pay a price for his body that needs to be cleaned up. Because those words that Jesus pronounced, that seal was not just for that temple. That seal was for people that were being stopped from coming there for the right reason. That seal was for every mom, every widow, every father, every son, every child, every person that would come there to bring a sacrifice. But somebody was trying to make a business off of them. And so he, bought, he got zealous. He got angry. His eyes were like this. He began to whip that place in order. You want to know what right I have to do this? Because I'm going to destroy this temple and raise it in three days. Through my body, I'm going to bring order. I'm going to bring order to the temple. I'm not talking about this building. I'm not talking about carpet cleaning. I'm not talking about remodeling. I'm talking about taking your life. Your life that is broken and beat up and hurt. I'm going to take your place. 
and I'm going to clean up shop. I'm going to clean up the body that was meant to carry the holy presence of God in it. But to be able to call, carry the holy presence of God in it, I'm going to be buried for three days. And when he was crucified and then buried, this is what's happening in the spiritual world. There's a rebuilding that's taking place. There's a rebuilding that's taking place. Every person that would one day believe in the name of Jesus would be forgiven of their sin, would be set free from every curse, would be broken off from any addiction. They'd be made a new creature, the Word of God says. They'd be made a new person, a new temple. Oh, Peter and Paul and so many writers in the New Testament begin to talk about, don't you realize that your body is a temple? Not for sexual sin, not for drug use, not for anything else. Your body is a temple filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, we got a problem today because people think they can be filled with the holy presence of God but live however they want. No, the first thing that takes place in every individual's life and it does not stop until my eyes meet his in heaven is he sanctifies me, he cleans me, he rids me of everything that, that drug me down, that bound me. He begins to clean me. His holy blood, he begins to wash me. He begins to bring my temple back into order you see without that moment of his crucifixion and his death this body would not have been made new and therefore could have never received the glory that was promised to it oh but Jesus he hung on the cross and Paul said I want to know the power I want to know the power of his death there is power in the death of Jesus. When we baptize people, we tell them you're being baptized into his death. When we kneel before him and he begins to wash us, forgiving us of our sin, he makes us a new person. See, Christianity offers that which no other religion, no, nothing else can offer. A true salvation. A true salvation. A precious salvation. Where a person is forgiven of his sin, washed clean, and given not just a new chapter of life, not just a new start. He is made to be a new person. That hard heart becomes soft. God's word is written upon it. Eyes open to see a new life. New desires are placed in that person's heart. New dreams are given to him. A purpose is given to him. A calling is given to him. A new life is given to him. And in this new temple, a temple is not fit. No temple in the Old Testament was fit unless once it was in order, according to everything God prescribed, then the glory of God, the holy presence of God, would visibly come down upon this temple. And as soon as God's presence would come upon this temple, it would become God's temple. It would become the temple in which sacrifices could be brought. Intercession could take place. Encounters with God could take place. God's holy, holy presence would abide there for his people. You see, what God did for you is that he cleaned you through his precious blood. He rebuilt your body to be a new body in him. It says in Galatians, I think, regarding the Gentiles, Paul begins to explain, listen, this message, this precious message of salvation is not just for the Jews. It's for every Gentile as well who is going to believe in Jesus Christ, be made a new creation and be grafted into this body. If you could stand with me to your feet. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
Can we please put that up on the screen? That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. I want you to look at this text. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5 and 7. This will be the last text I read, and we're going to be praying. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 5 through 7. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should also be heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Watch this. Of which I, this is Paul, became a minister according to the gift of grace of God according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. This message that Paul says was revealed to us, this gospel to the Gentiles, this gospel to the world, by his grace given to me to be a minister of this gospel, by the working of his power in me. You see, Jesus is the one that made it possible for your body to be made a new body, for your body being the temple to be restored, that his holy presence would live there. But to continue walking in this way, yes, the first thing is that God, he sets us free. He saves us, we say. He saves us. He forgives us of our sin, and he makes us a new person. And his Holy Spirit makes this new birth possible. But as I continue now to follow Christ, if you're already a born-again Christian. See, Paul says in these words, in these verses in Ephesians, he says, what God's called me to do by grace, his power is working through me to do it. The power of God, today young people listen especially, all of us, but young people listen, everybody. The power of God is not for us just to have a good experience. The power of God is not just for us to jump and to shout and to be happy. This is all wonderful. The power of God is for us, given to us for a specific purpose. The power of God is given to us to accomplish a specific purpose. And Paul says, I'm walking in the grace of God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And his spirit is like this power that's working in me. His spirit is effectively working in me. That's the power that's working through him. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon upon the body of Jesus when he fulfilled his purpose. When he said, it's finished, and God said, now I will do my part, and raises him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, Jesus is, we all know, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that baptizes now with fire. He's the one now that gives that glory of God, the glory of God through whom we have seen. He now fills each, each, each one of us, visits each one of us, encounters us. Has your temple been made clean? Has your temple been cleansed by him? Or are there things in your, in your temple, in your body, in your life that are not in order? Have you grown comfortable with where you're at? When's the last time that you experienced his spirit working through you in power while you're at home or somewhere else or fellowshipping with someone? God is able today to cleanse your temple 
God is able today to fill you with his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised his son from the dead. He is able. God, I thank you for every person that's here right now. I thank you so much. We thank you for your presence here in this place. If there's any area in your life you are in need of Jesus to bring it in order, to put everything in its place, to cleanse you, only He has the authority to do this. Your life can only be put in order by Him. Your life can only be made new by him. He took every sin upon his body for you. Every transgression, every curse, he took it upon himself for you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. If you are here with us, if you're watching us online and you need prayer, you need prayer. Maybe for the first time giving your life to the Lord, maybe rededicating your life to the Lord, maybe just an area that's become out of control in your life and you're in need of Jesus to bring it in order. You're in need of Jesus to cleanse your temple. You can write us, you can let us know that you're here and we're gonna be praying for you. God, we thank you right now for every person here in this place that is in need. Every person in this place that right now, Lord, needs you to change their life, to bring their life in order. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you're able to do. I want you to pray this prayer with me if you're here and you need this prayer, you need Jesus to help you where you are right now. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to say, Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus, that died for my sin, that was buried for me and was raised to life for me. I believe with all my heart in what you have done. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. And I ask you right now to come cleanse my temple what's out of order, put in order. 
What is out of control, bring under your control. I repent. I turn to you. Renew my mind. Change my habits. Work in me through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, allow your Holy Spirit. I ask you for your Holy Spirit to fill me, to refresh me, for your glory to dwell in this body. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you still need prayer because you're going through something or something's happening in your life or you made the decision for the first time today, as our worship team begins to sing, I want to ask you to come forward. I know that can be nerve-wracking, but it's so important for you to make a public action of the personal decision that you have made because you automatically are inviting someone here to stand with you, to pray for you, to see what's going on and to be of help to you. So if you prayed that prayer today and you need Jesus to help you, you need Jesus to either save you, forgive you, or to clean up whatever's happening in your life, then you can come to the front. We're gonna be praying for you in Jesus' name. Come on, let's begin to worship him.
Lord, we thank you. Come on, take a moment. Thank him. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the power of resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for your healing, for your restoration. We thank you, Lord, for your life that today is living inside of us, and it's evident, Lord. We thank you for this body that you manifest yourself through. We thank you, Lord. And today, Lord, as we were reminded, Lord, that we are one accord in your name. Stand in front of your throne. We honor you and we worship you. You are the king of our lives. And we forever be thankful for the sacrifice, for the bloodshed, for the resurrection. Words cannot say enough 
for what you have done for us. We worship you. We honor you. In your mighty name we pray. And everybody said, come on, give God a praise. Hallelujah. Jesus is worthy. He is worthy. And he continues to reign. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Continue on the celebration of Passover. Do not forget what Jesus has accomplished for us. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you guys on Tuesday.